uh, I'm from speaking from Wurundjeri country and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging from here, from all of the land and waters that we now call Australia and also all over the world. This is the outline for my presentation. I will do a little recap of previous seminars in terms of what I'm taking from them um, and now um, linking it with mine. Um, I will speak about my own position, give you a brief overview of my research and then share the initial research findings with you in order to provocate discussions. Um, the Q&A and the rest of the discussion is gonna be led by Adam. So the recap, when on the first lunchtime seminar, Dr. Pat Bonney um, said some very important things. One is that citizen science um, might have impacts that are not seen or planned for at the beginning at their early stages of their development. The other one is that data uptake is really valued by volunteers. And third, that we need to pay attention to boundary objects, such as databases. Um, and it's one of the things that I'm doing. From Jack, um, I share the passion for the attention to democracy in research and in technology. Um, and an attention to the promise that technology can help us democratize research. I want to remain very critical of this promise. So my own position, um, I love learning in conversation, and this is why I'm presenting now, to have a conversation with you, to provoke thinking, and to be provoked by you, by your questions, and even by what might not be clear from my presentation, and you might ask me to elaborate. I share in my core the ideas about education that Paulo Freire presented about education being an exercise in liberation, in empowerment, about people having their own knowledges, that they're not empty vessels, that we come and fill with knowledge. Um, like I said, I have a passion for the microdization in knowledge and decision-making and drawing on science, technology, and society studies. I am a foreigner here in this country, and I am a beginner in biodiversity monitoring, and that has helped me shape my thinking a lot, um, especially issues around the idea that anyone can participate in citizen science. Can anyone participate? Can a foreigner with no knowledge of biodiversity monitoring, such as myself, be monitoring frogs and birds in this country? What does it take for me to be able to do that? So like I said, discussion is very important for me. Feel free to post questions in the chat feel free to post questions on Twitter afterwards. I will be taking questions at the end though, uh, but just if you, if you wanna go and start thinking with me, just put your ideas on the chat as we go. The context of my research, the rationale is that um, volunteers are doing a lot of really important work in conservation. Um, and citizen science are increasingly using digital technologies for communication, for data capture, for data analysis. But we still don't know very well what are the risks and the opportunities um, as we kind of transition into these digital modes of citizen science. So my three research questions um, are, first of all, what is biodiversity monitoring in digital citizen science? Kind of questioning the assumptions of what it is supposed to be. Um, the second question is how digital tools shape the practices associated with biodiversity monitoring. And thirdly, how organizations are actually supporting volunteers in what they do and what they want to do, and how can they better support them? My case studies, one is a frog monitoring project. The other one is a bird monitoring project. Sorry for the boring table, but basically frog monitoring, it's encouraged in an opportunistic manner and during breeding season. In both cases, frog monitoring and bird monitoring, it's a survey. The bird monitoring is more encouraged in a regular manner and it's also looking at threats and management. 
alerts so, such as you know we need to actually put a fence around the the, the nest and I want to draw your attention to the official purpose. So what the official website says the program's doing. For the frog monitoring, they want to educate and create awareness, and they want to inform a waterway strategy. In bird monitoring, they want um, mainly to help in bird conservation. I'm drawing the attention to this because we're going to discuss what the purpose is for some of the volunteers and if you know there's a mismatch in that. Um, the technologies. So the frog monitoring program I'm looking at is using a smartphone app, both for data collection and analysis. The vet monitoring is mainly using a portal, though sometimes it uses a smartphone app as well. The data upload is considered individual. In the frog monitoring, there's no way to record in this case that you know I'm part of a collective, that I'm part of a friends of group or that I'm part of a land care group. In the bird monitoring, people can register that they are um, uploading, that they, they were with someone else when doing the survey. And the download is a bit restricted. So for the frog monitoring, people can download the files, but they cannot download the sound files. So the outer recording of the frog is not available. And that's a critical piece of evidence, um, as I will explain later. And for birds, um, only volunteers with administrator privileges can download some data. Um, in terms of communication, they're using Facebook groups, email, newsletters, and sometimes they meet face-to-face -face for trainings or for a debrief session or for informal guidance. I'm looking at these two cases with qualitative methods. I'm not gonna go into detail. But here today, I'm gonna to present findings coming from interviews and participant observation. And the warning is that these are initial. So I'm still doing some field work and I'm still developing my thinking around it. So in a field that changes all the time where technologies are changing all the time. Um, so just, you know, initial. The way that volunteers understand monitoring goes well beyond just counting species and reporting that with the app or the portal. They map what, you know, the, where the species are, they map trends, they try to understand the data in several ways. They might use different citizen science technologies and platforms to monitor an entire ecosystem because sometimes the apps are only paying attention to one species. So they need several programs to be able to monitor a whole reserve or a whole park. Um, they discuss the finding with others and they learn and educate others. If we look at this quote from a homeschooling um, mother, she's not only teaching her kids which frogs are around them, they are learning how to monitor biodiversity. They're learning the scientific method, which is going beyond of, you know, the educational purposes of the frog monitoring program itself. So like I said, monitoring is more than counting. So let's look at all these things. For example, with the frogs, the frogs are calling, we have a person, that person might be there for opportunistic reasons, just taking a walk, or actually following the, following the instruction to go monitor um, during breeding season or more strategic because that person is part of a group and they, they, they wanna monitor for a purpose. That person um, is recording and might have his family or others with him and they are learning together, teaching each other. That person might be also educating bypassers. Um, and this is what's happening at the site when the record's being done. Then at home, they might look at the app and see whom else is monitoring, where the frogs are moving, um, where the endangered frogs are, et cetera. So like I said, finding trends, looking at trends over time, over space. They might look at you know, what happened with the frogs when they did revegetation work and put native grasses. They might look at the interaction of frogs with pelicans and you know, you know, who, you know, who's eating the frogs. Um, 
they might discuss the findings with their, their groups, their environmental groups, land care, friends of groups, and they also do advocacy, sometimes very loudly, um, like I will explain later. For the birds, it's the same. We have the birds, the volunteers come in and they decide if they need to put a fence, if they, if they need to put signs. Um, they look for threats like humans and dogs, but also invasive animals and native predators. They educate other people at the beach and they might use binoculars as the main technology to educate and let people see the birds. And they use data to educate people, such as the survival rate of the birds that they know this data they know by heart. Uh, but that's at the site. Then when they go home, they have to fill in the survey, yes, but they also um, spend time talking to like park rangers or the police to about this management alert, these fences, what's happening at the beach. They might do advocacy. And especially they look at trends, trends that the organization does not necessarily provide for them, such as what are, what are the, the, the management actions that are working better to secure that the, the, the survival rate of the birds. So the role of technology in money training Technology is enabling them to do more data capture, more data analysis, and more communication that they are actually asked to do. But it is also, technology is also a way of constraining what they do. For example, what I mentioned about the, the data that they can download. Another thing that technology is doing is that technology in citizen science is, for example, allowing a frog call, a sound, to become a monitoring record and then to become evidence. Not any kind of evidence, scientific evidence. It's not the same to have a homemade video of a frog calling than having a data set records up in the monitoring app and to be able to use that. For what do they want to use that? Well, some of them, they wanna use it for advocacy for species conservation, habitat protection, and policy changes. This is another quote from an in, um, someone I interviewed. I'm gonna read it. We talked to the council some years ago about the need to strengthen the bylaws to protect the birds. And the initial response was, there isn't a problem. They stonewalled us. We went back with evidence collected from the database. That demonstrated with quality information collected by a large number of volunteers over a lengthy period of time that there is a problem. There is evidence. And that helped persuade the council to implement a new bylaw. So let's look at the creation of record, the flow of data. We have the birds, some of them are not making them. The volunteers do the surveys, they notice the trends and they go talk to council, but that's not enough. The fact that they notice the trends is not enough. So they go to their um, bird monitoring program and they have to ask for other people to download the data for them so that they can do a report and present it to council. And in that case, they actually get to change the bylaw. What also happens is that other volunteers see this and they are now, and it's now changing the expectations of other volunteers that they themselves could do the same in the future, that their actions could help change bylaws. I've talked about the importance of advocacy for some volunteers. What about advocacy for organizations? Well, what I'm seeing is that some organizations see themselves with a role in advocacy but they don't necessarily see the citizen scientists with a role of advocacy themselves. The other thing that I found is that, uh, sorry if I'm going fast, um, I'm trying to cover a lot too. Even if data collection is done individually, social connections are important. Social connections are important to start monitoring, um, they're important motivation to continue monitoring. Social connections lead volunteers from one citizen science program to the other. Social connections are important for collective monitoring efforts. 
like I mentioned before, the friends of group, the land care groups. And social connections are important to make sense of data. We make sense, they make sense, volunteers make sense of data. Sometimes in talking with each other, in talking with uh, project coordinators. But the apps at the platforms tend to be meant for individual users. So this brings me to the provocations that I wanna to present to you to spark our discussion. One is, um, and, and I tend to present my provocations as false binaries. So we have a false binary of top down, bottom up. We talked about projects that are top down or projects that are bottom up. But in this case, what I'm seeing is top down, so projects organized by, um, by a certain institution that are meeting bottom-up needs and local projects. So volunteers participating in projects, top-down projects that have their own agenda and wanna use their time in citizen science for their own purposes. The next provocation is about access and constraint. So yeah, coming from my research, we may think, okay, how can we allow volunteers to access data, data that they created for their own purposes, even if we haven't thought about that purpose when we created the project. But also, are we even aware as, you know, as we are creating citizen science projects, are we aware of the constraints that we're posing with the technologies that we're choosing? The next one is about knowledge and communication. Sometimes we think that knowledge production is separate from communication. What I'm seeing is that some of the communication channels, the emails, the newsletters, the social media channels, are not just used to you know, engage in a fun way. They are those are places for knowledge creation. Those are places for making sense of data. So in some platforms and apps, what's happening is that there's no place to discuss. There's no forums, there's no chat. So people go for that to other technologies. But then whatever happens, whatever knowledge is created in those other technologies, we're not capturing it. So my question is, how do we choose the platforms for social interactions and how do we kind of bring it all together? Do we have to choose one? Do we have to bring it all together? I don't know, I'm posing these questions. I don't yet have the answers. The last binary is about static and dynamic. We sometimes tend to create projects that are very static, um, but we are in a field that is, the where changes happen in a very fast paced manner. In one hand, because technologies change. And so we might devise an app, we might devise a platform, and then we have a new version of Android and a new version of um, the iPhone, and then the app doesn't work very well. That's one thing. But also we live in a, in a context of multiple environmental crises. So that the, 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 the environmental context is very dynamic too. Um, so how do we design projects that can cope with this dynamic um, projects and, and, and the, the digital interfaces that can cope with this dynamic nature of the world we live in. Um, those are my provocations so far. Um, I don't know if I've gone over my time. Um, I'm gonna leave the provocations up so we can have the Q and A and, um, and then the discussion. And thank you very much for listening. I look forward to your questions so I can um, do a better research. Thank you so much, Debbie. That was really, really interesting. And I'm sure people have a lot of questions and these provocations, I think are exactly what we need in order to 
start the conversation going. Um, and actually, the, your provocations here are sort of like a, a combination of uh, the question that I was going to ask you. So um, let me maybe start with that. And then I'll open the platform for other people to ask a few questions just specifically on the presentation before we go ahead to, to have a, a broader discussion on the topic. And so something that I wrote down that you said actually in the, in the beginning of, um, of your presentation is that you're working in a field that is changing all of the time. Yeah. And so that is um, connects to what you wrote here in, in the last provocation. Um, it's not just the field of citizen science that is changing all the time. It's also the technology that is changing all the time, right? Yeah. And so, so what do we do? How do we choose one technology? And then, you know, two years later, it's outdated. It's, is, is, I don't have an easy answer. Um, one of the things I've noticed when I was looking about um, citizen science technologies over time is that um, there was a time when there was an explosion of citizen science platforms and everyone wanted, wanted their own app. Having an app is expensive and it's not just expensive to develop it at the beginning, it's very expensive to keep it, to keep it up. So something that I'm seeing um, is a concentration of projects going into well-established apps and platforms that actually have the money to continue with the updates. So for example, at the beginning of my research, I talked um, informally with Bowerbird, the person that developed Bowerbird, which was a citizen science platform, um, really well, well used in Australia, it was created right after the Atlas of Living Australia. But that project ran out of money. And what ended up happening is that many of the records migrated to iNaturalist. In that migration, a lot of things were lost. Um, the, the smaller groups, the, the segmentation of the data that was created by groups was lost. And all the records were migrated as a single bunch to iNaturalist. Um, so what I'm seeing is, yeah, sometimes um, organizations have to make that hard choice between having a platform that they devised that, where they have control over things, but then because of not having resources, having to go to a bigger platform and which is more stable in, in theory. Because, um, you know, no, nobody guarantees that iNatural is going to be there in two years. But um, yeah, it is a hard choice. Yeah, I don't know. I think one of the, the things I'm looking at is who owns the data. So even if technologies change and apps go up and apps go down, do we have the capacity with the technology we were choosing to get all of that data and migrate it somewhere else? How are we thinking about our data so that it's ours, actually ours, and, and of the volunteers as well, if they want to migrate it to somewhere else? And yeah, those are the kind of things I'm thinking about. Thank you so much, Debbie. Um, so I don't see any questions in the chat, really. There's just one sort of operational questions if you have any of this published yet because people wanted to cite you. Mm. Um, no, I, <laughs> I don't have um, papers yet. I will be writing and submitting for publication the rest of this year. Yeah. So we're going to look you. forward to, yeah. to reading your uh, publications. Uh, but I would just like to open the floor if anyone has, maybe we have time for two or three questions, just unmute yourself and uh, you can ask uh, Debbie any questions on, about the presentation. Hey, Yela and Debbie, this is Kobe. Just a question to kick us off um, in terms of your provocations. Um, Debbie, do you think that we should have a platform for size social interactions? Or if, if we're going to use the existing platforms and what's out there, I like that you're thinking about kind of data ownership. A lot of people participate because they want that environmental data to be recorded and used in evidence, for example, but they might not feel the same way about their communications related to that data or, or mm. other kind of metadata potentially. Um, so have you thought about that and that there might be different types of 
access yeah. conditions for different types of data if we're starting to say for example that discussions on iNaturalist or other apps should become part of the yeah. data set that we're using in research because i'm not studying iNaturalist hey i'm just some observer um um, yeah, I might not have an answer about the iNaturalist forum, for example, but I do, I spend a lot of time thinking about Facebook. Um, we, I see a lot of organizations and the organizations that I study are using Facebook for social interactions. And that comes at a high price. Um, not only because we depend on Facebook to even show our posts to people or to see what people post, and the privacy being so bad. Also because um, what I'm hearing from volunteers is that they see Facebook as a necessary evil. They don't want to be there sometimes. They, they are just there because everyone else is there. So we, we might be coming to a bottleneck in which we need to decide um, if we need to develop our own or if we're gonna stay on Facebook. Um, some of the volunteers I'm interviewing, they much rather use the email and receive some of the news via emails. But when then when I talk to the organizations, they say, oh, but, you know, the newsletter open rate is really low. So we have a conception coming from marketing and whatever that if we're on Facebook and we get a couple of likes, we're getting more engagement that if people open the newsletter, only 10% of them open the newsletter. And we might need to question those things and actually do some testing and, and realize that actually what I know from my own practice, and this is not from my researcher hat, this is coming from my practitioner hat, is that if we have a collective of volunteers they might need some getting used to. So getting used to the fact that they're going to be receiving a newsletter every month and relying on that. Um, or getting used to the fact that the communication is going to be done via Twitter or via Facebook or whatever, but not just rely on this yeah, marketing impact assessment of the open rate or amount of likes, uh, but rather develop it as, as, a, as a practice and build it over time. I don't know about using whatever is posted on Facebook, using it for research is extremely contended because of privacy issues, because um, people are so identifiable there. It, it's, yeah, it's really tricky. Sorry, Kobe, that was a very long answer. So That's okay, you, it was an answer. I hope in your research you'll go beyond Facebook to think about not so much proprietary platforms, but where people are already sharing their data um, mm. and whether they're doing so in a way that is informed consent or not. But I want to let other people ask questions. Maybe we have time for one more question before we go uh, on to the discussion. So if anyone has a question, feel free to go ahead and ask. Yeah. Um, hi, hi, Debbie. Hi, Ella. Hi, everyone. Um, Debbie, I, um, I'm, I really thought your um, binaries are a fantastic set of um, provocations. Um, I guess I'm wanting to roll back a little bit on some of maybe the comparative work you, you've done. If you've been looking also at um, you know, your interest in digital citizen science, comparing, let's say, the Zooniverse platform and um, you know, as a as an, another extreme of digital citizen science, to what you're doing is a is a hybrid sort of interaction between the digital and the field work. And have you got any thoughts about some of the um, the the, um, the binaries in that respect, um, where you might be doing um, some thinking around what platforms you know have been adopted. Uh, as channels for digital citizen science and, um, uh, you know, and, and how they're facing similar binaries, perhaps. Mm. Um, I, I lost you for a second, Anne. So correct Ooh. me if I'm wrong. What, you, what you'd like to know is citizen science projects that are solely virtual. So people 
not relying on people going to the field and having face-to-face -face interactions. Is that it? Well, I, I'm, I'm sort of capturing what you've said about digital citizen science and, um, and um, looking at the, both the, the challenges and opportunities around digital citizen science and, and thinking about what other areas of digital citizen science exist in terms of you know, maturity such as the, the Zooniverse platform. And how those, and have you made any sort of comparison across some of the other other ways in which digital science is being undertaken with your own project? Mm. Um, I looked at those platforms such as Suniverse um, in my literature review. There's uh, more research done in those platforms and how people interact in those forums and their motivations and uh, the different kinds of contributors. Some of them are you know, just one-off contributor, others are regular contributors. Um, it has informed my thinking in terms of um, social interactions in digital mediums, for example, um, and how important those interactions are for, for sense-making, for creative thinking, even the usage of humor. There's some really interesting papers about, about that. I guess I will be able to answer better. So in my methods, I have interviews, I have participant observation of face-to-face -face interactions, and then I have content analysis. The content analysis is both of things that were um, published by the organizations I'm studying, but also coming from what I call particip online participant observation. So looking at these Facebook groups and all of that. And I haven't really had time to do a data analysis of, of the content. Um, so I do observe the same, the same kind of things that uh, were set from virtual citizen science, such as Suniverse, the importance of um, emotional, um, sharing um, the, the importance of learning, the importance of creativity, the importance of humor in, in these posts. Uh, posts. Um, but yeah, so far I haven't, I haven't done a, a very formal comparison. Thank you, Debbie, that's great.